I want to thank you all for coming here today and for those of you who are watching at home. Uh, we consider it a privilege to bring uh, this worship service to you. And uh, we look forward to uh, God speaking to all of us as we look into His Word. Um, this that we're, the series we're in is called United We Stand. It's been a, a powerful series in my life. Um, we began carefully looking at Jesus' prayer uh, for His followers, that His followers would be one. And not only His followers at the time, but those who would follow after, those who would believe according to their message. Jesus prayed specifically for you and for me. And um, so Jesus, during this prayer, He said an amazing thing about that oneness, that unity that He was asking the Father to provide for us. He said that our unity, our oneness, will show the world and prove to the world that Jesus came from the Father. Take a look. John 17, first in verse 11. Now protect them, that's His disciples, by the power of Your name, so that they will be one just as we are. And then down in verse 21, I pray that they, now that's us, We'll be one just as you and I are one so that the world will believe you sent me. So he's, he's saying that that is the effect of our unity. In other words, the fact that Jesus is real and relevant to our lives can be gleaned from our unity by the world. And on the other hand, shoe on the other foot, we take it from Jesus' prayer that if we as his followers are not unified, if we are divided or opposed to one another, then we're broadcasting to the world that Jesus is not relevant, that he is not necessary uh, for their lives. Because they can get what we have by ignoring Jesus if we're at odds with each other, if we're not unified. And you know, with um, if what we offer is infighting and hostility toward one another, they could say, "Why do I need Jesus? I can get that anywhere, anytime. Just go home." You know. Um, so we're talking here about this uh, unity that God has given us, and that we have learned in other passages of the New Testament that we are to maintain that unity. We're to make, in fact, every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And we do that by, watch next, by having a humble spirit. We learn that in Philippians 2, verses 1 to 4. And having a servant's heart together. John 13, verses 1 to 15 and verse 34. And last week we looked at surrendering our rights. These are ways that help us to preserve, these are the efforts that Paul calls us to. It takes effort to have a humble spirit. It takes effort to have a servant's heart. It takes effort to surrender your rights when you don't want to. But this is what the Bible calls us to do. We are to take great pains with these things so that our unity will be strengthened and preserved and protected. You see, the good thing is that we don't have to create that unity. God has already done that. We are united around the fact that we all belong to Jesus Christ because of what he did on the cross. In other words, because the gospel is true, the people of God are, in fact, one. We don't have to become one because we already are one. But like all spiritual truth, just because we are one in fact, in reality, does not mean that we act like it. Amen? There's a lot of spiritual truth that we fail to live up to, that we kind of even sabotage in our own lives, and unity is one of those things. Um, we are vulnerable to outside influence from the enemy of our souls, from the pull of this world on our hearts, from the influence of the sin within our own lives to try to break down and distort that unity. We've also said that we are in a day and time when the unity of the church has been under attack like never before in our lifetime. 
Our unity is literally under attack in these times that we live in. There are differences of opinion on many emotional and important topics that threaten to divide us and deeply and even break us and turn us against one another. Not that we all have to be unanimous because unity is not unanimity. Unity does not mean that we, will, that we all talk the same way, believe exactly the same way about everything. We must all agree to certain fundamental truths that define the gospel. But it, it doesn't mean that we must conform to one another outwardly or anything like that. Unity is taking the differences that we have and applying them all to a single goal. Let me say that again. Unity is taking the differences that we have and applying them all to a single goal. We are different in many ways, and that is by God's design. That's the way God made us. But we're all to be committed to a single great commission. Not your great commission and my great commission or someone else's great commission, but the one that Jesus gave his disciples and ordered them to pass it on to those who would follow. So we're committed to do whatever it takes to lead people back to God, to present Jesus Christ as the only true Savior of all. And we're to do that in unity, even though we are a fellowship of the different. Some of us are different. Thank you. Thank you. As a matter of fact, God has created the church to do exactly that. This is not sin. The fact that we all think differently and don't agree on stuff is not sin. It's reality. It's sin in the sense that we're not as smart as we could be if it wasn't for the fall, so we can't apprehend everything that we would like to. But it's not sin in the fact that God has designed the church to be different, to be diverse. That's the way He wants it. And that's what we're going to look at today. Look back on the things that make for unity. Let's add one today. Today's is embracing our diversity. Embracing our diversity. To embrace our differences. Not only to tolerate, but to actually actively embrace our diversity as the body of Christ in the world. A lot of evangelical believers get nervous. Nervous when we talk about unity. Um, and I, I understand that. Uh, you know, we tend to be afraid. Uh, I did a little um, rundown on this on our Facebook page a, few, a couple weeks ago, if you want to take a look at it. I'm footnoting myself. I can't believe I'm doing that. But it, we're afraid, especially if we're conservative in our views of the Scriptures. They're afraid, we are afraid, that, of going to have to give up core beliefs in order to be unified with others who disagree with them. But the reality is completely different from that. I mean, if, if you think about this for just a minute, why is it, do you think, that God cho- chose the unity, the oneness of the church, to be the number one means of communicating to the world that Jesus is for real? In other words, that they need Jesus. He chose unity as the main way to communicate that truth. Our unity as believers. The answer is as simple as it is brilliant. Because it was God's idea. God has created us to be different and unique. Now in the world, that can spell division and sometimes even chaos, case in point. 2020. But in the church of Jesus Christ, all these differences in opinions and shades of theology, and again, I'm not talking about the gospel or the truth or the word of God. I'm talking about things that could be one way or they could be the other. Evangelical options, if you will. These differences and variations of thought actually serve to show that what kind of love we actually have for one another. Our differences highlight our love and magnify our unity. Where else, I've said this before, where else can you go in this world and find people who are diametrically opposed on certain issues of politics or other heartfelt opinions and traditions or other things? 
Where else can you find people like that who would give their lives for one another? Where do you find it? You find it in Washington, D.C.? In the words of John Wayne, not likely, pilgrim. You're not, especially nowadays. Will you find it out in Hollywood with the entertainment elite? No. In fact, you'll find exactly the opposite. You won't find it in academia either. These are the things that we have been turning to as a, as a culture these days. Because people in academia have to toe the line in our schools and universities if they want to keep their jobs. They have to appear to be unanimous in following the naturalistic narrative of the world system. Or they'll lose their livelihood as well as their credibility and reputations will be destroyed. Now, the only place you'll find that kind of unity in the midst of complete diversity is in the church of Jesus Christ. And that unity, that oneness in the midst of differences is, according to Jesus, the most powerful witness in this world. That's why he prayed, you know, for his followers, not that they would be successful, not that they would be safe, he prayed that they would be one. Therefore, it's absolutely vital. Let me say it this way. It is not optional. Okay? It is not optional that we embrace our differences. We must embrace our diversity as a church, as a, the, the, the wider church and our local church. Or this unity of ours, as well as our testimony to the reality of Christ, will begin to become a joke. So how do we find this played out in Scripture? Well, actually, we find it on page 1 of the Bible, or perhaps page 1 through 3. You'll discover that God created man. If you go to Genesis, turn with me to uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. It's probably on page 1 or page 2 of the Old Testament. Verse 27 God says this, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So you discover that God created man in a certain way. He created him and he created her in the image of God. The imago dei is how they say it in Latin. It's a theological term. It means the image of God in man. The image of God is the potential to be like God. God has placed inside of every human that potential, that picture, if you will. And it shows up in ways that we don't expect. It shows up in ways that, uh, frankly, uh, so that people that don't even know Christ can behave actually in a way that is like Christ, sometimes more like Christ than some Christians they know. But everyone that you lock eyes with in this world has the potential within them to become like like uh, God. It made Adam and Eve like God in some ways. For instance, God is a community. Three persons, one essence. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all working together as three persons. Yet committed and tied to the same reality. That reality, by the way, is love. The Apostle John tells us in his first letter that God is love. Now, in that community, man was created. In, in that community, a key element of the Imago Dei. He was created to have community with God. He was also created to have community horizontally with other humans. He and she were created to have community with themselves. Not, not just each other, but themselves. Then something happened. Or rather, man dropped the ball. We read in Genesis 3 that sin entered the world... Man grabbed for sin as he took a hold of the forbidden fruit and ate it. God had told Adam that the penalty for doing this was death. So when they sinned, guess what died? Well, a lot of things. One of the main things that died was the community. The ability to get along with God. The ability to get along with others. 
and the ability to be at peace with yourself. So what happened to the image of God? Well, it was distorted. So now when we look at ourselves or at God or at one another, it's like we're, we're, we're looking into a mirror that you would find at the circus. You ever been to the circus and walk in front of some of the mirrors? You, stop, you, you go by there and you stop and all of a sudden you look like a string bean, right? I wish I could just stay there forever. Or you go to the next mirror and all of a sudden you're like that, that um, giant blueberry on Willy Wonka's chocolate factory. You're just, it's a distortion. It's not reality. It's not who you are. But the point is you don't get an accurate view of yourself or whatever it is you're looking at the mirror. You get a distorted view. Why? Because the image of God that allows you to have that community is broken. And so we are broken. And that distortion then causes difference. A distance, rather. Distance. Distance between you and God. Distance between you and me. Distance even between you and your true self. You ever notice how we have a true self that we don't want to think about, and then we have this cherry self-image that we like to project to other people in the world, that we somehow hope that that's really who we are. And that works fine for a while until we bump into our real self. And that happens all the time. But as we read the end of Genesis chapter 3, we discover that God was not taken by surprise with this event. In fact, He already had a plan in place. God had provided from eternity past that man would fall into sin, but also that God the Son would be born from the womb of a woman, live a perfect life on this earth, and crush the head of the tempter by dying on the cross and rising again from the dead, conquering both sin <clears throat> excuse me, and death, and stamping a giant expiration date on the head of Satan. Now fast forward to the first century church. In the book of Ephesians, Paul will write, as we've already read, in chapter 4 and verse 3, to be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And in giving that command... Paul in, in chapter 4, Paul had already explained to the Ephesians how that peace has come about and exactly what God has done to create it. So turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. This is probably a familiar uh, chapter to you. Verses 1 through 10 explain how God, through Jesus Christ, has solved the problem of the distortion in the image of God in us. And then uh, he will explain in verses 11 through 22 how he solves the problem of distance that that distortion has created. So for instance, look at verses 2, 8, and 9. We have it up here, 8 through 10. God saved you by His grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus, so we can do the good things He planned for us long ago. God healed the Imago Dei in us. This is what Paul is saying. And later in chapter 4, he'll say, okay, you have this restoration of your relationship with God, so don't mess it up. In fact, live it out. Live out this truth. And a vital, a vital part of this living out the truth is to guard our unity, Paul says, our oneness. So before we go on, I want to talk a little bit more about diversity. Over the last four weeks, we've been talking about all the things that divide people in our world today. That even things that even also divide Christians from one another. Christians who believe in the Bible, Christians who preach the gospel, Christians who love the Lord. Our division along the lines of race and politics, uh, especially in this time, which is so politically charged, has made it so you, you can't talk about anything without a political angle to it. And this can get really bad. And as a pastor, let me say that I'm particularly alarmed about the way these divisions are being argued in the public square. And some of the reasoning is... Um, that is used out there is also, sadly, tragically, 
being embraced by genuine followers of Jesus Christ. It's like the mindset of the world is working its way into the church and finding a home. One example is especially toxic and harmful, not only to our unity, but it can destroy any chance of maintaining unity. And this is something I'm going to call, it's not precisely the right term, but I'm going to call it guilt by association. In other words, this guy or this idea is bad. Those who reject him or that idea are good. Therefore, if you refuse to reject this person or idea, you're bad. You see that? Sort of a guilt by association? But I'll tell you, if you've ever read a book on logic or even read a blog on logic, you'll know that this line of thinking is not only unfair, it's completely against the rules of logic. Guilt by association uses what we can call the excluded middle fallacy. Okay, You take two opposing thoughts and pretend those are the only two choices available, completely ignoring the possibility that there is at least one other middle thought that may be true. We see this used all the time in political discussion, on commentary shows, and on social media. It assumes that the speaker's point of view is an established fact, and that they are not wrong in asserting it, not by a long shot. More importantly, it effectively shuts down any discussion because if this is already settled, what is there to discuss? No reason to debate. It puts people in the position of being intimidated and marginalized simply because they do not share the speaker's opinion. I'm not, trying, I'm not tying this to any specific point of view. You've probably seen this on all sides of the political spectrum. Turn on the TV this afternoon. You know what I mean. You'll see it all over. What distresses me, I should say this, um, in the world, on TV, I, I don't like it, but I'm not going to you know, uh, rise up against it because this is the world. We live in a fallen, messed up world. And the fact is, in the end, the truth will come out. <laughs> Maybe not until they write history books 100 years from now, but it will. But what distresses me is when I see fellow believers use this line of reasoning. If we eliminate legitimate debate, if we eliminate dispassionate inquiry, we shut off any chance of real unity. Agree with me or you're scum. What we have is not unity, but superficial conformity. Think of any totalitarian regime if you want to know how that works. Most of all, guilt by association is not loving. There's no humility in that. It's the opposite of humility. There's no servant's heart in that. It only serves one side of the argument. There's absolutely nothing even resembling the yielding of our rights, as the Bible calls us to, as a way of putting one another first. Now having said all that, as bad as all of this is today in this world that we live in, the church has in fact experienced a division that was far more destructive in her early history. In fact, it was at the very beginning of the church's history. Take a look now at verses 11 and 12 in Ephesians 2. Paul says this, Don't forget that you Gentiles, he's a Gentile is someone who's not a Jew. Okay? You Gentiles used to be outsiders. You were called uncircumcised heathens by the Jews who were proud of their circumcision even though it affected only their bodies and not their hearts. I love that phrase. In those days, you were living apart from Christ. You were excluded from fellowship, um, from citizenship among the people of Israel, and you did not know the covenant promises God had made to them. You lived in this world, watch this, you lived in this world without God and without hope. So Paul talks about this great divide that's going on in the first century in regards to two relationships. First, he talks about the division between the Jews and the Gentiles in terms of how the Jews saw the Gentiles. 
So horizontally. And then in verse 12, he talks about that same division in the vertical sense, where the Gentiles stood in relationship to the Lord and His Word. In the horizontal sense, Jews believed that staying away from Gentiles, having nothing to do with them, was righteous. That's what pleased God. So therefore, it was wrong and sinful to go to the home of a Gentile, certainly to sit down and eat with them, or have any other dealings with them at all. You imagine how that would work as an outreach strategy, right? Not so good. Now, some of this, in fact, to be fair, did come from Scripture. You know, when God's people are in the promised land, or even before that in the wilderness, God warned them to have nothing to do with the pagans and their rituals, and don't get cozy up with them, don't intermarry with them, or anything like that. But the Jews took it a a few steps further and developed an active hostility and a racist kind of prejudice against all Gentiles. They did this out of a fear of displeasing God, which they didn't really understand, but also because they believed they were superior as people. They were racist in the fact that they were supremacists towards their own race. And because they were God's chosen people, and the Gentiles were not. In the Gentiles' relationship with God, the vertical, the fact was they were excluded from the life of Israel because of their beliefs, because of their practices, and the fact that they were in in general hostile toward Yahweh and His law. As a result, Paul says at the end, they were without hope in this world because they were without God in this world. And that statement there at the end, that's in yellow there, shows... Um, marks the difference, I should say, between how the Jews related to the Gentiles horizontally and how God related to them vertically. God was of a mind to have mercy and give grace and to bring the Gentiles into the community of faith. The Jews, on the other hand, were more than satisfied to keep things separate and apart as they were. That division between Jew and Gentile, that distinction, was part of their identity as Jews. They were in some ways literally defined by their hostility toward Gentiles. The more separated from the Gentiles they were, the holier they saw themselves. And God, of course, does not think that way. He wanted to bring the Gentiles in and to create, watch this, a new single identity for both Jews and Gentiles. A single identity that superseded their original differences. And that's exactly what God wants to do in 2020, I believe. There are thousands, millions of people that are separated and hostile towards one another or anyone they disagree with, and they are more than happy to define themselves by that hostility, that disagreement. Define themselves by who or what they're against. I'm not saying that labels are always wrong. In fact, I don't mind if you call me a Dodger fan. I can take it. I think, aren't they going to win the World Series? Someone tell me. Not just, no, I'm not kidding. Uh, <laughs> anyway, yeah, you can call me that all you want. Our skin color or race or even our political opinions are not necessarily e- evil in and of themselves either. But through the toxic filter of our human flesh, it is easy to leverage those differences into a sinful and destructive pattern of life. And that is what we have seen for the better part of this year. This is why Jesus calls into the church people of every tongue, tribe, and nation. All races, all political leanings, all backgrounds, all abilities. We are a fellowship of the different. And that is by God's design. And why? So He could create a new identity for all His people that doesn't destroy our differences, but supersedes all other forms of identity in this world. So how did God accomplish this? Well, keep reading. Verses 13 to 18. We're going to go on two slides here. But now you have been united with Jesus Christ, talking to the Ephesians, who are Gentile. Most of them. Once you were far away from God, but now you have been brought near to Him through the blood of Christ. For Christ Himself has bought peace, has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people 
when in his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. The New American Standard translates that, for he himself, Jesus, is our peace. He broke down the wall of division. The wall of fragma. Fragment. Mankind is fragmented. You know what happens when your computer gets fragmented? Charles, do you know what happens when your computer gets fragmented? Okay, I, I had to look it up. But it means it goes slower. It doesn't work well. It's got data spread all over the place. So no one can make any sense of it. So they has to put everything back in order. Jesus did that. He, he made things right. He says, look, we're all level at the cross, at the foot of the cross. And what we need is the forgiveness of God through my blood, through my sacrifice. That sets everything in order in this world. No need for confusion. The only question that matters in this world when it comes to other people is where are they with Jesus? That's the only thing that matters. Not their politics, not their race, not their opinions, not their favorite sports team. None of those things will matter a thousand years from now. But where they are with Christ will be very, very, very relevant. But, oh, I haven't finished reading. I just stopped at verse 14. Verse 15. And he did this by ending the system of law with its commandments and regulations. He made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from two groups. Next. Together, as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross. And our hostility toward each other was put to death. He brought this good news of peace to you Gentiles who were far away from him and peace to the Jews who were near. Now all of us can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done for us. This is so amazing. What I want you to get here is one of the things is that... um, God not only brought us together through Christ, He literally made us one through Christ's blood on the cross. And because God did this, by doing something no one else could do, this oneness, this unity, is in reality indestructible. Do you believe that? Our unity in Christ cannot be destroyed by any other human being. No matter what we try to do. I mean... It's, it's eternal. That means that no matter how we try to mess this up, no matter how negligent we are in dealing with one another, our testimony will suffer, but only temporary, temporarily. Because the reality is still there, whether we live it out or not. But if we want to strengthen our unity, if we want to follow the commands of Scripture and make every effort to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, if we want to shine out as a church like a beacon of hope in this dark world proclaiming the gospel that jesus is real and that he is essential for our lives that jesus heals that jesus reconciles if we want that light to shine out brightly we must embrace our diversity We must rejoice in the fact that our differences united together around the gospel message can and will change this world. You see, what's important here in Ephesians 2 is not just the fact that Christ has made us one through the blood of His cross and through the presence of the Holy Spirit. It is the way in which we exist as one. Paul uses some metaphors, some word pictures as he concludes this chapter, to describe who we are as a unified body. Verses 19 to 22. Watch for the word pictures here. So now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens, along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family. Together we are His house, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets And the cornerstone is Christ Jesus Himself. We are carefully joined together in Him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. 
Through him, you Gentiles are also being made part of this dwelling where God lives by his Spirit. You see the word pictures? He uses three or four of them here. I want to, let's go through them really quickly. First of all, he says that we as Jews and Gentiles are all citizens together. Just like you and I are all citizens of whatever country we come from. All believers, regardless of their background or their race or their opinions, as long as we treasure the gospel, are equal citizens in God's kingdom. What does that mean to be a citizen? Do all citizens agree about everything? Do all citizens look the same, sound the same, dress the same? We have uniforms? No, of course not. Paul speaks here as a citizen of Rome, in fact. This is interesting. And this is one way in which God is implying that because you come to Christ, it doesn't, matter, it doesn't mean that you stop being Gentiles. It doesn't mean you stop being a Jew in terms of your culture and your background. A big reason that the gospel message spread throughout the ancient world in the first century was because of the fact that Gentiles were brought into the kingdom. Paul was sort of a hybrid in that he was a Jew, he was born, but he was born in Tarsus, which is a Roman colony, which made him a Roman citizen by birth. Having ties to Rome opened many doors for the gospel. And Paul was able to do far more than he could have done were he not a Roman citizen. The backgrounds of Christians who were called Hellenistic Christians in Acts, in other words, Christians that were not of Jewish descent, they were of Gentile descent, their backgrounds made it possible for them to spread out and reach out to their fellow Gentile friends and neighbors with the good news of the gospel. The diversity of the church as made up of both Jews and Gentiles in that background was a powerful asset for the spread of Christianity on the earth. And we as citizens of this country are also a diverse group. And God doesn't waste anything. Okay, He doesn't waste anything about your life. Everything about your life can serve the, the, the call of the Great Commission to make disciples. Everything. Because God doesn't waste anything. Especially when it comes to using your background to reach the lost. So we need to embrace these differences and praise God for them. And to see a precious value that each and every follower of Jesus Christ brings to the table. Just by being who they are. Look at the next one. He says, also, you are members of God's family. Not only are we citizens, but Paul says we're a family. A family is made up of different people. Do you agree? Wait till Thanksgiving comes and then answer that question again. Very different, some of us. I don't know about you and your family, but Debbie and I have four children. In spite of the fact that if you break up, in spite of the fact that if you break up our kids into pairs, two pairs, we have two kids that look alike and have similarities in personality, and the other two also are similar in those same ways. In fact, if you look at all their baby pictures, you might think that uh, they were the same child. They look so much alike, these two. First and third, second and fourth. But in spite of these similarities, each of our children is completely different. And Debbie and I have gone in, grown into, as we have grown into adulthood and now entering the seasoned adulthood, we find ourselves more and more grateful for these differences. And I'm here to tell you that each child brings something different and unique to our family. In fact, I think that if we had ten children, each of them would have been unique as well. And we're finding out the same thing about our our sons and daughter-in-law. They're filling in missing pieces. It's, It's amazing. Because of their differences. Each different and yet vitally important. And that's the way it is in God's family We are united together in the blood of Christ. We share the same bloodline spiritually. We carry the same Holy Spirit inside of us. And wherever you go in the world, when you meet up with someone who is a fellow believer in Jesus Christ, there's something there, isn't there? Have you experienced this? Whether you've known them for five years or five minutes, there's a fellowship there. The Spirit testifies with our spirit that we are all children of God, Paul says in Romans 8.16. The third metaphor is that of a building or a house. This house, we are His house. 
built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. That's Gentile and Jew. Now, the apostles were Jews, but New Testament, Old Testament. We're carefully joined, and, and then the cornerstone, of course, is Jesus Christ himself. And so, and, and as we are joined together carefully, we are becoming, it says, the temple of God, all of us. We are a place where God's presence resides in the world. That's what he says. Part of this dwelling where God lives by his spirit. Later, he calls us the body of Jesus Christ himself in a spiritual sense. But notice how Paul describes us here. He says that we are individual stones that have been carefully fit together to make up this testimony to love and power and sovereignty of God through Jesus Christ. We are God's residence that you can see from the street. That's who we are. Not the building, folks. You and me. We are a building with doors wide open. Amen? Anyone not allowed in here? I tell people all the time, come, come to our worship service. It's free. Totally free. You don't have to pay us anything. Just come and sit down. Have a good time. The doors are wide open. We accept anyone who would open their hearts to Jesus. Or even those who wouldn't. Regardless of any di- of the differences that normally divide people in this world, and, and we're calling people to come inside and join us to let Jesus cleanse you and renew the image of God within you. To let God heal the distortion that you see when you look at yourself and others. And even when you look at God Himself. To come inside and let Christ close the gap between yourself and others. Between yourself and God. And even within yourself. To bring you back into community to complete your identity you can be defined by the everlasting image of god because of what jesus did on the cross by paying for your sins and conquering death on your behalf brothers and sisters this is the work that we are to be about And this is the way in which God will bless and energize our ministry. As we make every effort to maximize the unity that God has created for us through Jesus Christ. As we lean into our fellow connection to God and through the Holy Spirit that dwells in us. To use all of that to show people, to prove to them that Jesus is not only real, not only relevant, but that He is essential for their lives. That Jesus Christ will change their lives in ways that no one or no thing, no amount of money, fame, fortune, anything on this earth can match. As I close here, let me just encourage you to ask yourself a couple of questions. First of all, who are some people in the Bethany community who are different from me? It's a question I need to ask myself. And how am I embracing that difference in my relationships with them? Who are some people in the Bethany community that are different than me? And how am I embracing those differences in my relationships with them? Secondly, are there any differences that, admit, that exist among me and Christians I know that make me uncomfortable or even a little hostile? And, and what am I going to do about it? These are important questions. How can we invite others into a new citizenship, a new family, a new household if our community is frayed and fractured? Our oneness does not come cheap. Jesus had to die for it. It is precious and valuable and it must be cared for and maintained if it is to have the power that it should in this world so that all will believe that you have sent me, Jesus said. It has power to point people to the one who is our peace, and that is Jesus. Let's pray together.